preference folder. So I go to computer. I delete my 2016 folder. And I'm going to go into my oops, folder here, into 2510. And I'm going to copy this 2016 folder and paste it right onto the P drive. And then I open up Maya. Okay, that's the workflow every single time. So as you're working on stuff, if you need to write that down or tattoo it on your cat, do that. So you remember exactly how to do those steps every single time. All right, so now that Maya is open on my computer, I can't just open my file, okay? Uh, Maya likes to keep things organized. So like last night, I was in the Tuesday, Thursday intro class. So I'm building a room in the Tuesday, Thursday intro class. I'm also building a room in this class. Maya has to know which room I'm working in. If I just go to open, sure, we know what room it is, but Maya doesn't know, okay? So we have to make sure we tell it where we're working. So part of that uh, tattooed message would be under file, and then we would go to set project. So I'm not even opening my file yet. I'm just setting the project to tell Maya this is what I'm working on. It's thinking so. There we go. So I go to File, Set Project, and then I click on the room that I'm working on. So in this case, it goes into my P drive, into my name, into 2510, into work, and I tell it that I'm working on my mini room from Monday, Wednesday, and then I hit Set. After all that's done, then I can go to File, Open Scene and actually open up my latest scene. Okay, so you're processing that every single time you work in Maya. Copy your preferences, set your project, then open the scene. Every single time, not every other time, not as you feel like it, every time. And as you work, we need to stay organized because if we don't stay organized, stuff starts falling apart. All right, so the first thing I'm gonna do before I even get into um, doing any texturing or coloring is I need to save this off, okay? We don't wanna rely on just having one file called desk. We wanna have several iterations of it. If I screw up on this file, I can always go back to one of my other files. Or if this file gets corrupted, I have other versions I can go back to. So my first step every day after I've opened my scene is to save the scene as and just append it with a number two or a three or a four or whatever number it is you're at. Okay, and again, this stuff is the automatic stuff. This is the stuff that by the time you've graduated from the area, by the time you're actually working in the field, these are the things you need to have done. Keeping everything organized, making sure your names are exactly what they need to be. All right. go here I'm gonna go there I'm gonna go to this all right so what we're gonna do is we're gonna play with um, some of the different materials on your definitions sheet remember your test for your definition sheet or your test for the definitions is uh, next Wednesday um, we have several different materials that are on this list okay one of the materials is a Blinn, another one is a Lambert, Fong, and then a Mia is on here too. So we're gonna talk about what those actually entail. So what I want you to do is grab any item in your scene, I'll grab my coffee cup, and you're going to just hold the right mouse button down on that object, and then go down to assign favorite material, and then go to Lambert. So I'm holding my right mouse button down on my coffee cup, I'm going to assign favorite material, and then I'm going over to the word Lambert. Okay, now what happened was when we went to Lambert, you may have noticed that the right side of your screen changed. Okay, before it was this guy. It was the layers, or the layers here and the channel box there. And what happens is, it opens up what's called the attribute editor. Okay, so your hotkey for attribute editor is control A. Yes sir. Okay, so it's annoying for this thing to happen. If I hit control A on and off, on and off, you see how it's resizing my screen and it's pushing everything over? That's super annoying to happen. 
So what I like to do is I like to make sure the actuator editor is open with control A and I like to just drag it off the screen. So I'm just going to click and drag so that it's floating now so I can move it wherever I need to move it. All right. So now as I open up the attribute editor, I don't need to worry about it. Now up here, I'm going to leave it in this window so we can see it. But again, typically I throw it off onto this screen here so that I can see my entire window. All right. So typically it'll be off to that side. All right. Now looking at what we have inside here, there's a bunch of tabs on top. So there's a tab that says P-Cylinder 1, and then another one that says P-Cylinder Shape 1. Then there's one that says Poly Bridge, then the one that says Delete Component, and then Poly Split Ring, and so on. And I can use these arrows to get further and further down. The Attribute Editor is essentially everything that has to deal with that object that we have selected. So I used my cup and I assigned a Lambert, so it just automatically opens the Attribute Editor. This stuff that's in here is all the history that went into making it. So remember last time I showed you making this cup, how I could use that bridge tool to bridge this gap right there. Okay, so there's the bridge. And if I needed to, I could um, change some of my options. So I could add the twist right here. I could add a taper in there. I could play with the taper curve and control how this thing is actually tapering. Um, I could change the smoothness on it. I could add more divisions and really play with what this is looking like. Okay, So we typically get more settings here than we would over here. Remember over here it also shows us some of those settings. We also usually get a little pop-up that shows us some settings. So it's kind of like importance. When we make a tool like a bevel or extrude or a bridge we get a little, a little window that says, here's the top three or four things you would use. Over here on the right, here's a little bit more information. And then in the attribute editor, here's everything. Here's like every single piece of information you could want to do to this specific object. Okay, so I'm just gonna reset this back to where it was there and there, there. Okay. Um, so, uh, I don't need this bridge anymore. I'm happy with the way the cup looks. I don't need to change any of that stuff. Also, it has a delete component. At some point, I deleted something, and so it, delete, it has a delete component thing. I also inserted an edge loop, and if I change this weighting, somewhere on here, I may have deleted it. I may have inserted an edge loop and then deleted it as part of the demo. Um, I extruded a face, so if I needed to change my movement here, there it is, oops. So you can see how I can adjust what that um, extrusion was, okay? But I'm done with all that. I'm done with moving any of these things around. I like the cup exactly the way it is. I don't need to adjust any of those other things. So what I want you guys to do, because I'm going to do it too, is we're going to hit the delete history button that we created a few days slash weeks ago. Okay, so we hit the delete history button or we go to edit, delete by type history, and it'll do the exact same thing. So now all of that other stuff that we had, the poly extrude face, the bridge, the beveling, if we had any beveling, the deleting component, inserting edge loops, all that stuff is gone. Basically like Photoshop, it's flattened this object into exactly what we see. So there's no way for us to go back and edit the bridge or the extrude or any of the other stuff. Uh, we could still move points around, we could still tweak the shape, uh, but everything else is just kind of like flattened out. So typically after you're done modeling something like this, or like the chair, you can see how much stuff is on the chair, all of these tabs here that went into creating that chair, all the way back to the original cube we started with. I don't need it, so I could delete the history on that too. Okay, now I wanna show one thing before we get into doing anything with the cup one or whatever one you selected. Um, on this chair, we have four tabs, okay? On the cup, we have three tabs, all right? We'll see where the other tab is in a second. The far left tab that's on here, this is called a transform tab. And its whole purpose is movements, rotations, and scales along with some other properties. So again, these are like the top 10 things that you would typically need to do to a surface. Here are those top 10 things. 
display has the visibility down here. Um, and then we also have stuff like shear, which maybe I need to shear the chair a little bit just to kind of give it a little bit of movement like that for a Dr. Seuss book or something, I don't know what. I've actually never used the shear. I don't know why it's there. Uh, we also have things like pivots. So we could move the pivot in here, but I um, very rarely use that. Uh, some of the other stuff that's kind of neat are these drawing overrides. If I go to drawing overrides, I can enable an override and I could say I want this to be shown as a bounding box. Okay. And with this as a bounding box, what it does is it just says, I'm going to draw the extremes of this shape. So it's this big by this tall, that's what I'm going to draw. So imagine that we had not one chair, imagine we had a stadium, okay? Just opening the file would take forever. Rotating around the file would take forever. So we could do a drawing override on the entire heavy duty stuff and just make it boxes and that will work a lot quicker, okay? Especially when you get into like animating things, it goes super slow when you have all this heavy geometry. Um, for this class, there's not a whole lot of stuff we need this for, but just so you know, there's some extra stuff inside here. So there's lots of different tabs that are inside of this window um, that will help us along the way as we get further into Maya. Um, rarely do I use this tab <coughs> in an intro class. Typically, I do everything right here. All my translates, rotates, and scales are right there, so I just mess with them in the channel box. The next tab is called the um, shape node, okay? So the first one is essentially, if you imagine, um, where is this item, how is it rotated, and then how big is it? That's what that is. This relies more on the individual components of what makes that item what it is, what it looks like when it renders, everything. So if I go down here to smooth mesh, let's say, and I say I wanna see what a smooth mesh would look like on this, you can see how I could turn this on and off so I can get a smooth preview of what this would look like. I could also say I want to display the subdivisions and I want to increase how many subdivisions I would have on something like this, okay? So I could take something very blocky and make it very smooth by using these options that are controlling the individual components of the object. Again, you don't typically play around with too much stuff that's inside this tab. It's really on a very specific basis of what we need to go into, okay? But sometimes we may go into this area. Um, just as a fun thing, I could also turn off things like this item will not cast shadows, or this item will not be visible in reflections. If I model the vampire and I put him in front of a mirror, I could say you're not visible in reflections. Um, the next two tabs, we have initial shading group and we have Lambert 1. And these two guys, just like the first two, are linked together, okay? So these two are linked. Every object in Maya has a transform node and a shape node, every single object in Maya. Every object, and I'm not talking about lights or any of the other stuff, they do too, but um, as far as geometry goes, everything has one of these. Uh, for materials, this is what this is, okay? We have an initial shading group and we have Lambert 1. We never, ever, 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 keep going, ever touch Lambert 1, okay? If we start playing with Lambert 1, everything in our scene will turn whatever we change this to. So if I were to go into here and I made this color green, everything in my scene is green, okay? So we don't want to touch Lambert 1 because this is the default. Everything that gets created gets Lambert 1 dropped onto it. And then after we're ready for it, then we can start assigning specific ones to specific objects, okay? So don't touch Lambert 1 ever. I click on the cup, here's Lambert 2. I can do something with Lambert 2 because it's not Lambert 1. This one is specific to this item, okay? So um, I'm just gonna go to the color here and I want you to go to your tab that says Lambert 2. I want you to click on the color swatch and just pick a color. Okay, and if you accidentally close your attribute editor, control A pops it back open. All right, so I can click on that color swatch for color and I could give it whatever color I want this to be. All right, now our purpose 
in doing this type of thing and playing with a Lambert is we're trying to emulate a real world surface. This cup doesn't exist in the real world. Maya doesn't know that it's a cup. It doesn't know it's made of porcelain or ceramic or glass or whatever. It has no idea what it's made of. It could be made of wood or metal. So what we have to do is we have to use materials that help us emulate what the items are. So Lambert uh, is a kind of material. And one of the things with Lambert is that there's no shininess to it. So if you had a chrome ball or if you had a piece of metal or a piece of plastic, typically you would see some sort of shine or shimmer across that object. Lambert's have none of that. So it's a completely flat object, okay? Typically everything, and when I use extremes like everything or always, there's probably like five times or six times that there's not, but most of the time, okay? So always every surface has shininess to it. It may be spread out very, very big, <clears throat> or it may be very, very tiny, or it may be very sharp, or maybe very whatever, okay? So typically every surface has some sort of shininess to it. Even the drapes here, those are affected by the light and how, or the blinds, they're affected by the light. So if I did have a light over here, we may see some shininess riding along that, okay? So Lambert is not typically a good material to use for things because it's totally not realistic at all, okay? But let's go through some of the material thing, items just so you can see what they do. So color is exactly that. What color is my object? Is it a blue ball? Is it a red ball? Is it a green ball? What color is it? Transparency is transparency. If I crank this up, you can see that this glass has some transparency to it. I can start to see through the glass. Um, ambient color. If I pull this up, what this is going to do is it's going to take that color. And if you look at this little ball, that's like a little preview of what it's going to look like. So if I pull my ambient color up, what this does is it takes that color value and just flattens it out. So instead of this looking like a nice round ball, it's basically imagine that I lit up an object evenly from every single side. It would look like something's perfectly flat. There's no contrast from the side to the front. So we typically don't use ambient for a lot of things, okay? Um, there are times where you may want to use an, uh, maybe a smidge of ambient in something, um, or you may do it for a very specific purpose. You're rendering something out that you want to look cartoony. You may use ambient, but most of the time, like 99.99% of the time, I never use ambient. Um, there's also incandescence. And this may seem similar to ambient, but what incandescence does is it's more of like a glowing feature. So if we were to create a candle and we wanted a flame on it, we wanted the flame to glow, we could put incandescence on there and it would actually glow and not super flatten out like the ambient would do. Okay, typically I don't use incandescence either. Typically we don't use Lamberts, but I wanna go through these things just so you can see what they are because these terms are used throughout. Um, diffuse, so our color right here is this green color this diffuse is essentially how much of that color are you actually using. So right now at 0.8, we're using about 80% of that color that we've chosen. If I pull this up higher, now I'm using 100% of that color, okay? Now this becomes important for certain things like uh, chrome, okay? So if you were to look at a mirror, what color is a mirror? Right. It's all different, right? Because mirrors don't actually have a color, they get their color from their surrounding. So in a mirror's case, there would be zero diffuse. So it doesn't matter what this says. Um, so there'd be zero diffuse, all reflection. But in some cases, like maybe a car, there might be half of the color information is coming from here, and the other half is coming from the surrounding environment, all right? So that's where we would use that value for diffuse to control how much color is part of that equation as to where it's getting its actual look out here. Um, there's translucence. This is a transparent property. So if you think of like uh, a bed sheet or you think of curtains, if you walk behind it and there's a strong light, you can't see through it, but you can definitely see that there's a shadow or there's something on the other side of it. All right. Or candle wax, <clears throat> how you can't see through it, but it has kind of like a glowy attribute to it. Um, so that's where that would come in. 
Now, there's a bunch of other stuff that's inside here, um, but we're gonna stop there because we don't need to go through all of those. Now, these here are what make the Lambert specific because all the adjustments that we typically would do are in this top area and there's no other area that we would typically adjust. So now we're going to right click on this and we're going to assign a new favorite material called Blin. Okay, so you can grab the same object, you can pick a new one, doesn't matter to me. Okay, so right click, assign favorite material and then choose Blin. Okay. Now Blin, if you look at the little icon for it, um, the Blin's icon, if you look at it, it has a little bit of sharpness to it, right? It has this highlight happening right at the center of this. So the Lambert, no highlight at all. This Blin, we actually do get a highlight, okay? Now if you look at the top section of this, you'll see that the top section is identical. Color, transparency, ambient, incandescence, diffuse, translucence, and so on. But then we get this other section called specular shading. And the whole reason behind this is we're controlling that big bright spot. Like what does that look like? If this is a piece of hard plastic, that bright spot might be super sharp. If it's something that is maybe like a brushed metal, it may be spread out a bit, okay? So these settings here allow us to control what that looks like. We can also control how much reflection um, there's very little reflection, there's a lot of reflection. Okay, so we can play with those settings. A blin is typically used for hard plastic materials. Okay, something that has a very spread out um, specular because we can have a lot of control over what that looks like. All right, so now we're gonna right click and we're gonna go to assign favorite and go to regular fong. Not fong E, just regular fong. Okay, and just like Blin, we're gonna see that we have a highlight right at the center of this. <clears throat> and the highlight right at the center of this um, is controlled differently. Again, the top section is all very similar. And then the bottom section, we have this one control for what that looks like. On the Blin, I had two controls allowing me to control what that specular uh, shape looked like. Here, I just have one. Typically, I'll use a Fong for something that is more metallic, okay? Now, like I said before, I typically don't use Lamberts. I also very rarely use blends or very rarely use Fongs. But that doesn't mean that once you get out in the world and you're doing stuff that the company you work for may rely on those, okay? The next material I'm gonna show is something that is more realistic looking and it's something that you would use if you're doing photorealistic type stuff, okay? For these, these are all fake. When we watched that tin toy animation, when we watched the birds, we watched all those, all of those were created using these kinds of shaders because at the time the computers couldn't handle realistic stuff. It was just like, we're gonna do our best to fake it. And they did a really good job faking it with all of those, um, but it was all fake stuff. The reflections were fake, the lighting was fake, everything. So um, we're not gonna use any Fongs in this class, we're not gonna use any Blends, we're not gonna use Lamberts, but it's important to know those in case you ever do need to use what those uh, names are. So now we're gonna right click on our object and we're gonna to go to assign new material, not favorite, we're gonna assign new material. Okay, this populates a huge list that we can choose from of things. Now one of the issues that we have with all of our materials is that they're complex. I mean you saw all the little tabs that we could go through and pick color diffuse, this, 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 a whole lot of stuff inside there. And it's very, you know, which material do we pick? I don't know what to do, whatever. It becomes very confusing. So what we wanna do is from this list here, I wanna choose this mental ray material section. Okay, so I'm just gonna click on the word materials. Does anyone not have the mental ray material section? Okay. Um, if you don't have the mental ray material section, you can just close that window and you can go to window, settings preferences, plugin manager. And I'm showing this because at some point, everyone will get to the spot where you do need to load this thing. And then way on the bottom, there's a maya2mr.mll. We just have to make sure it's loaded and auto-loaded, okay? So all the materials that we've looked at, Blin, Fong, and Lambert, those are Maya materials. 
meaning that the Maya software uses those materials inside its daily workflow. The one we're going to use is a mental ray material. Okay, so it's basically uh, a plugin for Maya that allows us to create much more realistic things. Like when you drop glass inside of a Maya software one, it doesn't look like glass at all. Okay, but when we use the mental ray one, it'll look a lot closer to glass and then we can nudge it and get it a lot better. Okay, so that process again, just so you can see it, window settings preferences plugin, and then we find the Maya 2 MR, which is Maya 2 Mental Ray, and we just load it and auto load it. And then we just close. Then we can right click and go to assign new material, and then we should see Mental Ray in the list. Now it's there? Cool. All right, so once we have this, all of these are Mental Ray specific shaders, okay? So that means that these are made specifically for Mental Ray. If you have Maya at home, you'll need to find Mental Ray for Maya plugin and install that into your software also so that you would get all of these things. Okay, it's free. You don't have to pay a single thing for it um, except for some download time. All right, so inside this list, we're going to pick the most colorful one, which is this MILA, which is a Mila material. <clears throat> All right, so the Mi La material, it pops open with this first tab. Remember the Lambert had two tabs, okay? Every material has two tabs to it. One of them is a shading group. Again, 99% of the time, you're never gonna touch the shading group. Randomly, you will. You'll get a job where it's like, oh, I need to go into that and just type in some values or do something specific. Most of the time, you don't need to play with it. The other tab, so you can click on the right tab, this is the material. Now your first indicator, um, or first sight of this, you're thinking, holy cow, this is much more simple than the other one. How could it be much more realistic? All we have is one color choice and one slider. What material, or what uh, color do you want this, and what's the roughness? There's some stuff down here, but that's not you know anything we're gonna play with. So pick a color from the list, from the color and then what we want to do is we're going to render this so I'm just going to scoot out a hair there we go. and I'm sliding my attribute over to the other window alright so we want to render this so we can see what it looks like in your very top bar here on the very very right side they have this little clapper you know the clappers where they have those like action you know take four type things that's what these are. So there's one that has an eyeball. You don't need to click the one with the eyeball. You're gonna click the one to the right of the eyeball. Okay, so don't click the clapper with the eye. You click the one to the right. And remember, if you don't see it, it might be hidden behind one of these little arrows. All right, so what does your object look like? It's gone, right? So Mental Ray has its own plugin. Mental Ray has its own shaders. So when we render, we have to tell it that we're using Mental Ray and not, if you look at the top here, Maya software. So I'm gonna choose from this list Mental Ray. And then on the far left of this window is that same clapper, I can just re-click that clapper. Okay, so now we should have our object actually inside of our scene. So we clicked on this to choose Mental Ray. We clicked on the far left clapper to show or to re-render that specific scene, okay? Now, just like everything in Maya, I try to whittle it down into what you actually need to know. There's seven trillion buttons. I want you to see the buttons I'm constantly using over and over and over again, okay? So inside here, there are five buttons that I will typically use. These first three and then these other two. So the first one we've already done. Hit that and it renders everything that we're seeing, okay? So if I remove, if I spin my camera around like this, or zoom out or whatever, I can hit that render button again and it'll just re-render what I did, okay? So now I want to, let's say I just changed the cup color, all right? So there's no point in rendering out everything inside the scene. I only change the cup color, so I only wanna see the cup. So if I draw a box around the cup, like that, I'm gonna go change my cup color so this actually looks like something different. There we go. 
And then I'm going to click the next button, which is this render region. And when I click on that render region, what it does is it just renders what's inside that box. Okay? So it becomes very, very quick uh, in order for me to render stuff out. Um, down here on the bottom, it says render time. <coughs> My old render time was four seconds. This render time is one second. So obviously, I've sped it up by just rendering this one area. Some of your renderings, when you click that button, it may take an hour to render out just what we're seeing here. For this class, it shouldn't be an hour, but you do get to those, those points where it does take an hour or two hours or three hours. Um, I've even had it where I will render like that much and say render region, and that would take an hour, okay? Um, depending on what you have in your scene, these things can take a long time. So we wanna maximize our stuff as best we can. All right, so the next button here is snapshot. So what this says, it's kind of like progressives, but not really. Um, it takes a wireframe snapshot of our view, and then I could marquee an area and then do a render region. That way I can just, I don't have to render the entire thing and then do this render region. I could just say, let's do a snapshot. Let me grab the cup and let me do a render region and then we're good. Okay, so those are the three I use on that side. The other two that I use are right here. And these are super awesome tools because they allow us to save a snapshot and then review a snapshot, okay? Or save it and then remove it. So let's say um, I rendered the whole screen here. And then I wanna change the cup color. So I'm gonna go to my cup color here. I'm just gonna pick a different color. There we go. All right, so I'm gonna marquee an area. Now before I go and I do my render, I wanna compare. What did the color look like before? What does it look like now? And that way it gives me an idea of what's gonna look better. So I'm gonna say before I render this, keep this image and then render my new image on top of it. So now I get this little slider bar and I can compare which color looks better, okay? Now in this case, it's pretty obvious. I went from blue to yellow. In some cases, we're gonna take a slider and we're gonna nudge it over like 0.2 and then we're gonna be comparing what it looks like. And sometimes it's very difficult to remember what it looked like before. So this keep image is essential to do that. So I can also remove if I'm done with it, okay? And it's also good to see a progression. Like when I start texturing something, I'll keep every image, okay? Here's where it started as gray, then I added some color, then I did this, then I did that, then I did that. And you can see if what you're doing is actually making it better. Sometimes we just kind of keep at it and we've lost our direction and, and now it starts to look horrible, okay? So how do, how do you look at both? once you hit the keep image and you render a new one, then you can just use the slider on the bottom. Okay, but now I have the same image, so it's not going to even do anything. All right, so those are the five that I use inside of here. So I'm going to close that. And what I want you to do, <clears throat> um, oops, sorry, not yet. Um, yeah, what I want you to do is I want you to go to this diffuse button, and I want you to choose reflective plastic from that list. Okay, so this is one of the neat things about Amila is that it's basically like you make one material and then based on that one material you can choose what kind of material you're trying to to emulate okay so here I want a reflective plastic so when I chose from diffuse to reflective plastic now I get more options and if I'm in my scene and I render this out again you'll see that we do have some reflection on here Okay, now one of the issues with reflection is it's doing exactly that. It's reflecting. So this cup, even though it doesn't look very shiny, is reflecting stuff. Okay, but what is it reflecting? This. It's reflecting nothing. So we don't see anything in there. So sometimes you'll put something on here like reflections and it won't look very reflective until you look at it from a different angle. So just me spinning around, it's not showing anything. Let me pull my glossy blend up, pull this roughness down. There it is, okay. So it was reflecting, it was just very, very 
uh, subtle. You can see a little bit of reflection here. On my screen, I see it a little bit more. Maybe if I pull this up here, you can see it a little bit better there. Okay, so you can definitely see there's some reflection happening inside this cup, um, <coughs> how subtle, however subtle it is. All right, so now we have a couple options. One of these options is glossy blend. So this is essentially just how much reflection is on this cup, okay? I crank it up to one, it's pretty much 100% reflecting all the way around. The glossy roughness is how sharp that reflection is, okay? So imagine that you had a piece of plastic that is buffed and polished and it's super reflective. You can look at it and pretty much see your reflection in it. But then you take a piece of sandpaper and you scratch at it, well now your reflection is basically spread out. Okay, so that's what that roughness is doing, is it takes this shiny reflection like this, and I crank that up, and it's gonna spread that reflection out over the entire cup. So it's not gonna be a crystal clear reflection, now it's gonna be a very soft reflection around there, okay? This bottom number is the, <clears throat> it's called the IOR, it stands for Index of Refraction. And it's essentially when you look at, and you can do this while you're driving, while you're stopped at a light, not while you're driving, when you're stopped at a light, is you look at the car in front of you or to the side of you or whatever, and look at the reflections. Looking head on at the reflections, you get different reflections than you see going around the sides of the car, okay? So that's what that index of refraction controls is how those, how those reflections are affecting us, okay? How strong they are head on, how strong they are on the sides. <clears throat> and we can play more with that kind of stuff. All right, so what we want to do is before I move, oops, I clicked the wrong button. Uh, before we do anything else, we want to name this. Every single material, just like every file, should be named. So I'm going to call this cup underscore Mila. That way I know it's a cup that I have assigned this to, and it's a Mila. If I had several cups of different colors, I may also say cup yellow underscore Mila. That way I know. This is a cup, it's a yellow material, and it's a Mila, okay? I can take this one Mila and I can assign it to any other object in my scene. So if I had 700 cups in my scene, I could grab 200 of them and assign a yellow cup. Then I can make a new material and assign a new one to the other 500 cups, okay? So this is basically just a definition of what our object's material is, and we can assign that definition to any other object in the scene. So now what I want you to do is just go through your scene and just grab other items, assign a new material, pick Mila, give it a name, so chair, uh, brown, Mila. And I'm going to pick brown from the list. There we go. And I'm gonna change this to reflective plastic and I'm gonna pull the glossy blend down, pull the glossy roughness up, and there we go. So you're gonna go throughout your whole room and the walls and everything else and just assign flat coloring right now to each one. Make sure you name your stuff. Um, we wanna save often, number one, and number two, we wanna choose up here in this renderer, see where it says renderer right here? We wanna choose legacy default viewport, okay? That will make everything red that's better than stuff crashing, okay? So we just have to know that my chair is brown because I've chosen brown. But when I hit the render button, it still shows up as brown, okay? In the viewport in our Maya file, it's going to look red here, but we don't care as long as it's not crashing, okay? So from renderer, choose this legacy default viewport. All right, so it looks like everyone has at least a couple objects that are textured. Um, we can continue that same process because everything that we do, it's the same thing over and over and over again. Um, also, so you're aware, there's a certain workflow that certain people will adapt. Um, for me, I enjoy doing all my modeling and then doing all my texturing as two separate items. Some people will model texture, model texture, model texture. So as we were building the desk, some people would have modeled it and then textured it right away and then model this and then texture that right away and then done each one of these things the same exact way. So, all right, so um, another thing that we may wanna do is we may want to assign something besides a flat color to our object. 
most items in the real world have more than just a flat coloration to them. Um, even like this pen here, if we wanted to put this pen on my table, sure it looks pretty white, but there's also like labels on it. So I may want to put a label on my item. Also, if we look very close, there's probably like, not in this pen, uh, but there might be like scratches or scuffs or bite marks or something on there that maybe we want to add into that as well. Um, so what I'm gonna do is let's say my computer screen here, I want to add a picture to my computer screen. So, um, and a couple of you already kind of figured this out is that we can assign things just to faces also. So if I just go to faces and grab this, I can assign a Mila right to that face. And so right now it's just white. Let me save my scene just so I don't cry. Oops. And go back to Mila, and then I'm gonna say TV screen. All right, so what I need to do is I need to bring an image inside the color so that it's not just a flat color. So I'm gonna go to uh, Internet Explorer and a website that you can lock into your brain is called textures.com. You'll have to register for it. It's a free registration, um, but it is the best resource for getting textures for things. If I needed a picture of something, I go to textures.com and I use the, this to get my pictures. So I'm just gonna log in really quick. And you get 15 credits a day, and basically the lowest resolution picture is one credit, and then the next step up is two credits, and then you have to pay for a membership if you want anything higher than that. So for this one, let's say I'm watching on my TV, I'm watching a bird. It doesn't matter, but Dodo, sure. Uh, where'd you go? Did I pass it? There he is. Thank you. All right, so I click on the Dodo bird. I don't want his butt. I want this one. Um, so this one is two credits. You can see right here, two credits, 1600 um, by 1350. And here we don't care about actual resolution. I don't care about an eight by 10 at 300 images or 300 DPI because I'm not rendering it out or I'm not printing it out. Uh, all we care about is actual pixels. So typically you want to grab the biggest one that you can find. Um, in this case, I may want to use download more than 15 pictures today. So I'm gonna grab the smallest one that I can. Um, especially because it's gonna go on a small item, I'm not too concerned about it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go to my download area. There it is. I'm going to cut this image and I have to put it in a very specific spot so Maya can find it. So inside of my folder, my project folder, we have source images. Remember I said we're gonna use three folders, images, scenes, and source images. This is where I put all those images, okay? Those are 3D paint textures, ignore that. It just goes right inside of source images and so now when I come back to Maya, I need to find a way to add a texture to this. So if you look at the far right of the color swatch, there's this little checkerboard. Any checkerboard means map. It means you can connect something to it. So if I click this map, it brings up another dialog that says, what do you want to connect to it? And there are some things in here like ramp. Maybe I want a ramp. Maybe I want it to look like the ocean or a crater. Um, I'm bringing in a file, so I'm going to click on file, and then I'm going to click the folder, and then I'm going to click on my birds. Now you see how I went to file and folder and it went right to my source images because it knew you're bringing images in, I'm going to go inside source images. If it didn't, I'd never ever ever click outside this, always inside source images. So if my texture isn't here. I go into Windows, I find it, and I drop it into the correct area, okay? Because if I load this bird, but I left the bird's picture on the desktop here, my home computer is not going to know where it is, and if I switch to a different computer or someone deletes it, it's not going to know where it is. I need to re-go get that. So everything goes in source images that we bring in. So now I have this bird on my screen. So now let's render it, and we're going to see the bird is probably rotated 
and zoomed in. Yep, there he is. <laughs> so this is like a, a part of the bird, not the full thing. So this is a 3D object, right? My entire screen is a 3D object. I have a 2D picture. Maya doesn't know how do we take a 2D picture and put it onto a 3D object. So we have to tell it how to do that. So it's not a, for something like this, it's not a complex process. So I click on the face again. I go to UV and I say planar. And I'm gonna go to the option box. All I have to do is say, you figure it out. Use the, whatever works best, just figure that out, Maya. And then we project it. So now I go to render again. And you'll see there's my bird. Now here, he is rotated 90 degrees laying down. Well, under that same UV menu, you'll see that there is a rotate. And in here, there's a 90 degree angle. So I can say rotate. So now, whoops, he might be upside down. So that just means I have to rotate him 180. Yep, he's upside down. So now we go back to this face. We go back to UV, we go back to rotate, and I'll just type in 180. Now there's easier ways to do that once you are more comfortable with the software. Right now we're just doing the easy, just go to the button and click it. There he is, perfect. Okay, and because it's a computer screen, I should probably have some reflection on there. So I'm gonna delete my history because I just did some stuff. I'm gonna go to my diffuse and make this a plastic I'm going to sharpen it up. There we go. And then I'll render again. All right. So now you can see it actually looks like there's a little bit of reflection inside the screen. So now it's actually looking like there's a computer screen uh, on there. Okay. So I can do that for any other objects inside my scene. So let's say my uh, this thing. Let me assign a new material. I'll assign a Myla or a Mila. This is my bookshelf. And I'll click the map button. I'll click on file. I'm gonna go back to here. And come on. I'm gonna type in wood. Because in this case, I'm gonna have a wood bookcase. Now, as you look for textures, you want to find something that would be appropriate for that item in the real world. Something like this, which is basically like boards hammered together, wouldn't make sense for us to use to create a bookcase. Okay, that doesn't make sense. Mm -hmm. Same thing here, same thing here. These are not wood bookcases um, textures, not that. So I want to find essentially a fine wood working um, item. Now I can also just go over here into the wood area <clears throat> and go down to fine wood. I may have gotten rid of it, but they had another subset that said finished wood. Uh, so something like this could work. Something like that, something like this. That actually looks pretty good. All right, so I'm gonna click on that one. All right, now you'll see that this one right here, it says seamless, okay? So what may happen is let's say we have a, um, a floor that we want to be this kind of wood. If we had that picture of wood on the floor, what it would do is it would stretch out to fit. So this picture, because this is just a picture of like a flat piece of wood somewhere, in the real world is probably like this big. But in Maya, we're stretching it out, so it looks horrible, right? So what we do to correct that is we repeat it. We take that pattern and we repeat that pattern over and over and over again to make it look like it's bigger than it is. So having this be seamless um, is important. Now in order for it to work, what we have to do is the left side of the image needs to match up perfectly with the right side. The top of the image needs to match up perfectly with the bottom of the image. So here I'm able to zoom out just a preview what this would look like if I repeated this over and over and over again. And you can see overall, it actually works pretty good. You can definitely see the repeats. You can see this pattern in here where we have the same item over and over again. But we would never ever ever typically look at the flooring like we are here. Usually there's stuff on it. There's desks, there's tables, there's whatever. So um, I like to make sure that I grab, if there is a seamless one, grab the seamless one. 
So I'm going to save it. I'm going to open my folder. I'm going to cut it. I'm going to go into my folder here and here and here and here and there and paste. Now when I go back to Maya and I go to my folder and I go to my source images, which is right there, the wood is right there. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to save again just to make sure it doesn't crash. I'm going to render. And this will probably look horrible just because, again, that texture isn't laid out how it should be. You can see I got this weird like zigzag here. Um, this looks really flat. This is really stretched out. So what I can do is under UV, there's also an automatic right there. So I do automatic mapping and now now it looks like it's actual wood. Okay. Now under the covers of what this is, it's not doing a good job, but visually as a, as a first time doing this kind of thing, it's good enough. Okay. When we get onto our next assignment and our next assignment, we're going to be very specific about how our textures are being placed on an object. Okay. Just to kind of point some out some of the flaws of this out, let me zoom in real quick here. So you can see in this case, the wood grain is going that way and this is going this way. If this was an actual piece of wood, maybe this wood grain here would go up and down. Okay, just like this one is going left and right because it's a horizontal piece, this one would most likely go up and down. Okay, just to make it look more realistic. Also, there would be some way that this, what we have in, in the real world, we'd have like notches or something cut in there, whatever. All right, but for this, it's fine. Oops, all right. So now what I want you to do is experiment with some files. Go on to textures.com, register for an, an account, and then download those files and then try them out. Make sure you don't go outside your source images folder for it. All right, so typically this is the flow we work with. We assign materials, flat colors to many things, and then those specific items we may assign um, actual materials. The more realistic you wanna go, the more materials you're gonna have on your objects that have actual coloration to them. So if I go to this. So if we look at something like this, all of these things have not just color associated with them, but they also have um, they also have an actual texture put on them. So each piece is, each piece of this wood has a specific wood texture that is assigned to it. And one of the things that we always have to fight inside the software is the look of CG. For something like this. This actually looks pretty decent, except it's maybe a little bit too crystal clear. Um, in how it looks, it looks pretty realistic. One of the things we fight is rep repetition. So this piece of wood, we can't use that same wood look for every single board. Otherwise, it's gonna look like a repetition of that same board, okay? If I have a tree and it has a knot right in the middle and I duplicate that tree and scoot it over, and that one has a knot in the middle and I duplicate it, Okay, you get the idea that each tree would have a knot, so I have to create very realistic uh, or very natural looking textures. So that process does take time. All right, so you'll see how to do all that stuff as we go. Um, a lot of this kind of stuff is actually like painted stuff. So we could actually bring our, so our geometry into another software and we could actually paint textures right on top of it. So if we wanted these planks to be wood, I could bring up a wood picture and just paint it and then I could darken in areas, I could use the clone stamp, I could do whatever to make that wood look very specific to that piece of wood and then do the same thing for all the other ones. Now most of the time people are going to duplicate their stuff in a way that it doesn't look like it's rep repeated. So like for these wood planks here, it's hard to see in the projector. Let's see if I can find a better image. Um, bow, 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 bow. That one's pretty. All right, so for this, these may be different rocks that they have here, and the rocks may have the exact same picture, texture, color on them, but what they may do is they may rotate it over, so now the texture is different, or they may rotate it this way, or they may scale it up or scale it down or tweak the coloring of it. 
just so that specific rock looks different than all the other rocks. Uh, <laughs> big contrast. Um, <laughs> so our next step in this is that we have textures. The next step would be lighting, okay? So in our scene, we're gonna add a couple lights in something like an ILM or a Pixar or whatever. They would add hundreds of lights to their scenes to make them look realistic, all right? So inside of our um, create area here, we have a lights tab. And in the lights tab, there's a bunch of different lights. We're gonna stick with one main light for our stuff, which is an area light, okay? So under create lights area light, I'm gonna create an area light. And then I can move it. Yes, sir? Uh, if we're not finished with the texture, we can... So after, <clears throat> after I have a light, uh, I want to pay attention to a couple things. One, the light is square, okay? An area light is typically square because it helps you emulate an actual light source. It also has this little pole sticking out of it. That little pole points the direction of the light. So that way we're not lighting up something behind us, which we don't need to do. So an area light points straight ahead. There's other area lights inside here, like you may see a um, V-ray rectangle light. That's something totally different. And there's also a physical area light. <clears throat> we don't want that. We want just this regular area light. And what I'm going to do is I stick it outside the room. I'm going to rotate it. Oop, not rotate. I'm going to leave it just like it is. Um, I'll rotate it in a little bit. Okay. And just like other stuff, I need to adjust properties for this item. So I'm just going to render it just so you can see. Get. Okay, so one thing we get with this area light is we get shadows. Before we didn't have any shadows. Um, a default light is created at the startup of Maya and until you put in a light it's using that. That one doesn't come with shadows. Now these shadows look pretty ugly. They look pretty horrific. Now that's Maya's way of just dumbing the light down just so we can get an idea of what it's doing and then when we're ready for the final image it'll actually make it look nicer, okay? So we ignore the graininess and the ugliness of that. Now we want to adjust some of our properties. One of the things that default lights do is they give off a constant intensity. Our light stop, starts here and it goes on literally forever. So there's no like drop off to my light source. And there should be, because in the real world we have a drop off to our light source. So in the attribute editor for your light, you're gonna turn on your decay rate. So let's change this to quadratic, and that will turn on our drop off. How did you get that? Control A, okay. Remember Control A will open your attribute editor. Now when I render it, after I've turned drop off on, you'll see that my scene turns totally black. Because I have drop off, my light is just dropping off right away. It's like not enough light now to actually get to my objects. Yes, ma'am. Which light were you using? The area light. So under the area light, we've changed this to a quadratic decay rate. I'm gonna then crank up my intensity. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you get to the area light? Uh, create lights and then area light. I'm going to take the intensity up to on mine about 5000. Okay? So we created light area light. We changed the decay rate to quadratic. And now I've cranked up my intensity to 5000 which ends up being way too bright. I'm going to go with 2000. Okay, and what this light will now do is it'll actually drop off. It'll actually start at a point and gradually get dimmer over the course of however far it goes. Still a little bit too bright. I'm gonna go with maybe a thousand. You'll always play this game of never hitting it right on target and you have to bounce around and adjust stuff, okay? And you can't use my numbers for anything because your scene in every instance is going to be different than mine. So you'll have to play with the numbers. If mine's at 2,000, you can't say, well, his is at 2,000, I'm gonna set mine to 2,000. You have to look at your scene and say, do I like the way the lighting's looking? Yes, no, adjust it harder, brighter, whatever. 
All right, so this gives me pretty good overall lighting. I can always come back and adjust it. Now, I need to adjust some other stuff. So I've only adjusted two things so far. I've taken my intensity up to 1500. I've taken my quadratic decay here. <clears throat> I'm gonna scroll down into mental rays area and I'm gonna turn on uh, one thing, use light shape. And then I'm gonna set my high samples to one. So I open up mental ray area light, use light shape as on, high samples are one, and then I will re-render. And you'll see just by clicking those buttons that our lighting doesn't look a hundred times better, but it definitely looks better than it did a minute ago, okay? It looked, if I go back to my previous image, because I saved it, there it is. It looked pretty ugly here. There it's looking a little bit softer, a little bit more natural than what it was lo looking before. Okay, so what do these buttons do? So the graininess of our light, of our shadows, is controlled by these high samples, all right? So it was at eight and I knocked it down to one. When it's at one, it's basically telling Maya, I want you to figure out the stuff for me. You just figure out what it needs to be smooth. And if I need to, I can go in there manually, if it's still not grainy, and start playing with this number. But typically we don't have to do that. The other thing, use light shape. So what is it doing now is it's using the size of this light as the actual size of my light source. So if I go and scale this down super tiny, like that, and I save my image and I re-render it, what we should get is a different lighting. Our shadows, if you look at them now, are crystal sharp shadows, okay? Look at the shadows before, look at the shadows after. So because my light source is super tiny, it gives me super crisp shadows. As I make my light bigger, I get super soft shadows. So I can play with this to control what my shadows are looking like. Um, so I'm gonna make this kind of big like that. And what I want to do is have two lights. I wanna have basically like them pointing at a uh, triangular type way into the room. If we look at this side of this desk here, you'll see that the desk side is completely black. Our light is hitting it perfectly from the front, and so there's no bounce light in the scene. Like typically you would have light hits a wall, it bounces off and lights up other stuff. We don't get that by default and we don't wanna turn it on because it's gonna really slow things down. So we wanna fake it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this light and scoot it over and give it this a little bit of rotation. And then I'm going to duplicate it scoot it over to this side, rotate it, maybe I'll even rotate it down a little bit and raise it up. And then I'm gonna lower its intensity. So if this is 1500, I'll make that 500. Five hundred, maybe too little. Let me make it a little bit bigger. Just render that section. There we go. Okay. So I cranked that one up to a thousand, and that gave me probably a good enough number. Maybe seven fifty would have been a better number, uh, but I can keep playing with it. Okay. But the point is, is that I'm adjusting these things based on my need. I needed a little bit more light on this side. I added a light and pushed it into that area. Okay? So as you start to play inside Maya, you'll find these little things like, oh, I need another light here. I need another light there. I need this to do this. So don't ever think that your scene is ever completely 100% done. Oops. Make this a little bit wider. Um, there's always stuff we can do to make it kind of enhanced, make it look a little bit more realistic. Like you saw in that video, um, there was a lot of color inside the light too, so it wasn't just like white light, which is what we're dealing with now. So we could add color to our lights as well. So if I go back to my light, I can take the color here and I can give this a tint. Now, anytime I play with light color, I wanna go subtle with it, okay? So if I take this saturation um, down like this, 
I typically go about here, let's say, or here. Because a lot is going to go, or a little bit's going to go a long way. Okay. Now, it's hard to see because of the light color I picked, but it did color it some. So let me change my color to something a little bit more drastic, like red. And I save my image, I'm gonna re-render it, and then we'll be able to see what this looks like. And you'll definitely be able to see it on the gray pieces more than the other ones, but there's definitely like a red coloration to this. Let me go back and forth so you can see it. Okay, so you can see how we were kind of in a green area. We were a little bit more gray back here and now we're definitely in the red zone, okay? So we can keep playing with these settings and keep playing with these settings until we get something that we're happy with. Save that again, let me render again. But on that light, I changed four things. I changed it to quadratic decay, I changed the intensity up, I told it to use the light shape, and then I told it to be one for the high samples. Okay, every area light that I create, that is what I do. Okay, every single area light I create, the same exact settings across the board. Now I may adjust them once I get it kind of in that zone of it's set up and now I need to tweak it, but everything else should be good. All right, so definitely a different look than the red. You can see now we get this more of a <clears throat> yellowy tint to our scene. Okay. So another light that you may want to use is a um, point light, okay? So an area light is basically a flat plane shooting light into our scene. A point light is a little dot. So imagine a light bulb. It's a little dot where the light just goes in every direction. I use these to kind of fake where a light source may be coming from if it's not um, like one of these. Like one of these lights up here Typically these are area lights. If you're in a photo shoot, they have those big box lights, those are area lights. But if I have a light bulb, I use a point light to emulate what a light bulb would look like. So I'm just gonna quickly create a sphere. I'm gonna make a sconce. Sconce. There we go. So here's my sconce. And I'm just gonna delete that. Okay. So I'm going to take my light here, I'm going to drop it, oops, too far, into my scans. I'm going to set the same stuff. So I still have a quadratic decay because every light, unless it's in some different universe, has a decay. So I'm going to set it to quadratic, 200 for the intensity, let's say, and then render. And then what we should get is light shooting up out of the sconce. And look at what we get, light shooting up out of the sconce, okay? Same thing would apply if I just deleted the bottom of this. So if I went in here and I deleted the bottom of this and it was more like a lampshade, we should get light now shooting up the top and out the bottom. Okay, now that 200 is really bright. That's why we have the sun right there. So let me take that sun down a little bit. Point light, point light. And you have to realize too, like what we're looking at, like my area lights that are outside my scene, those are way too bright for me to have a light on in the house and make it look like there's a light on. Okay, if it's the middle of a summer day, our house is already lit up turning a light on doesn't have a huge effect, right? So we have to kind of fake, uh, or we have to guide our scene to making it look appropriate, okay? So I'm gonna just knock down, just to show you, I'm gonna take these lights and I'm gonna knock this down to maybe like 300 here, and maybe 250 there. All right, so now I have more of a dark scene, so maybe it's a night scene, and now my area lights are not my main lights, they're just kind of like filling in some of those gaps. And my actual light source, I want it to appear to be coming from this. And I think you get the idea that it looks very much like my light source is coming from the sun right there on the wall. Let me change that still. That's still like crazy hot. Uh, let's go with five.
There we go. So that's looking obviously a lot better. It looks much more natural, much more realistic. Now we still have the issue of that light still looks like it's a CG light. Do you see how perfect the light comes out and it hits this wall and makes this shape? It sort of kind of would do that, but not realistically. Um, oops. I'm going to jump to Explorer and I'm going to go to Google. And Maya has ways to make your stuff look photorealistic. It's just a matter of finding those ways to make it look realistic. So they have these things called IES light profiles. An IES light profile is uh, companies like GE and um, other manufacturers of lights. They make these images of what the light bulb would look like when it's lit up. So this light bulb here would look like that. This light bulb would look like that. So what I can do is I can actually download a pack of these from there. Okay, so I can download this, which I've already done. And I can go into the correct folder, which is my downloads, IES profiles. And I'm just gonna copy these into my folder. Monday, Wednesday, source images, paste it there, okay? So now I can jump back to Maya, jump back to my point light, where are you at? There you are. And I'm gonna go down to the mental ray section and I'm going to load one of those light profiles. IES profiles. I don't know what any of those are specifically, but I think maybe medium scatter might look neat. So now when I go in here and I render it, what I should get is something that resembles more of an actual light bulb instead of this perfect glowing light. There we go. Now you can see we have this little glowy part coming out. Now one of the things, like I said before, a point light is essentially a dot and the light emits from all directions. When we use this, it doesn't. It only emits from one side. So right now it looks like that side may be pointing towards the right. So I'm just going to rotate this down like that-ish. And it might be that that specific profile only goes off the one side for whatever reason. We'll find out. I don't need to render the whole scene, but I keep doing it. Nope, it was just like that. So that is how that light prof profile looks. If I don't like it, I'm going to pick something else. I'll pick jellyfish. That might be interesting. Jellyfish. Okay. Now the other thing is that this light profile only goes one direction. Right now it's going down. So I'm going to duplicate it and rotate it upwards. Duplicate, rotate. And I'm going to type in exactly 180 so I get the exact 180. Yeah, jellyfish sucks. <laughs> Uh, let's make a different one here. Let's go to three lobe umbrellas. That might be good. Let me go to the other light bulb. Because now that there's two light bulbs in here, I have to do each one individually. There we go, okay? So now that those are obviously there, now they're a bit dimmer because of their profile, I can go in here and maybe set their intensity up to 30. So you see how this, you can't get into the, the process of thinking that there's going to be a click, 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 and then you have Jurassic Park or Toy Story. There's a process. There's building things and shaping things and customizing things and tweaking them. That looks much better. That looks much more realistic. Um, for our scene. Now you imagine that we had that in a lampshade or we had it wherever and again we're pushing this to be more realistic. We're pushing it to look less CG and more photo real. Okay? So um, what I want you to do for the rest of the class is just play around with all those things we've done. Add some area lights to your scene. Make sure you understand those settings that we went over. You don't need to do the point lights. In most things we're not going to typically deal with point lights at this stage. I just like showing them because Usually people are like, I want to put a lamp in my room. And so that's how you can add a light to your scene. Um, play with the materials, adding textures on there. Um, when we come in next week, 
you should be at this stage of having all of your objects modeled that you want in there. And I don't want just the desk and the room I, and the uh, and a chair. I want other stuff in there. So easy stuff, a wastebasket, a cup on the table, uh, picture frames, whatever. I want the room to have some life to it, okay? Um, have the stuff textured, have the stuff lit. When we come in on Monday, we're gonna go through and we're 